Okay, good, good morning everyone and again thanks for your time. I'd like to introduce this morning Richard Rice, um, a, a geologist who has been at the forefront of lots of exciting things. Um, he, he's, he started off, interestingly, went to school at Kimberley, Boy, Kimberley Boys High School and, and he tells me his grandfather actually came from Barclay West, so straight away there's obviously a, a diamond link. And then he went to Rhodes and finished and graduated um, at WITS. Um, he then worked as a field geologist for Shell Coal, Anglo Vale and PPC. And then he, he was very um, early into and pioneering in terms of using computers and geology. He initially set up a coal system called, called Minex. And then he was one of the pioneers and builders of data mine, which I think many of us in the, in the geological profession would have used and know. So, so that's really his early claim to frame. Um, and then after leaving data mine in 1997, he went back into more sort of traditional geology, worked, worked quite extensively in, in diamonds with Petra diamonds and Exceldium, for example, in Angola in, and on the, our west coast. And then subsequently gravitated back into gold. And he's worked in amazing places like China, Mongolia, Siberia, and, and, and currently in Zimbabwe also in areas like Ethiopia, where he's looking at um, industrial minerals, high quality silica sand for glass making. Anyway, Richard, thanks for making yourself available and giving up the time. And we look forward to your presentation today on uh, you know, a country that's fascinating, but has some, and also has some amazing um, ore deposits. Thanks. Right, John, thank you very much for the introduction. And also, thank you very much for the invite to uh, participate in this group. I, I spent a couple of very interesting Thursday mornings listening to the various presentations. Um, I'm going to talk today on what I found to be a very intriguing uh, project. We got involved in about, or I got involved in about 2012, um, and we spent a lot of time. We actually operated out of Monrovia, not out of Conakry, and I'll show you in one of the plans, I'll show you exactly why we did that. Um, alluvial iron ore, or detrital iron ore, what is that? I mean, as South African or Southern African geologists, I don't think we come across that very often. We used to the stuff that comes out of West Africa, uh, Sinindu is one of the projects that actually has a, a fairly substantial resource in terms of the, of the detrital iron ore. And we basically got involved up in uh, Liberia in the early days on the back of the Western Cluster. You can actually see that over here. Um, our, there, was, there were some shenanigans around that and our license to the Western Cluster got withdrawn, but the Wallagisi project was up for grabs. So we, we hung around, we uh, took up two other projects, one called Timber uh, down in the, uh, uh, in the southern part of Monrovia and we took up the Po Bapulu range, which is uh, in this area over here. Uh, but neither of them were particularly good. But we took them up to, to maintain a presence in the area, uh, hoping that the Wallagisi project would be granted to us eventually. But uh, that wasn't going to happen. So we, we decided we needed to actually start looking for something ourselves. Um, and we'd come across, obviously, this, this nefarious thing called Kanga. Um, we understood it to a certain degree. Uh, we also uh, understood that we weren't going to find any hard rock deposits anywhere. So we started looking around, and the most obvious place to look for these is alongside the existing mountain ranges where you have iron ore. So we looked at uh, the Western Cluster, we looked at uh, the Pulu, we looked, we got hold of uh, spot images all over the place, and eventually um, we found some interesting stuff uh, around Nimba. Now, I'm just hanging on to this picture just to show you the setting. This is Nimba over here. You've got the Ivory Coast coming through here. You've got Guinea, uh, Conakry sitting here. The, it's over a thousand or 
almost 1,500 kilometers if we went out from Nimba to Conakry. But coming through from Nimba through to Port Buchanan is an existing railway line which uh, Oslo Mattel uses uh, up onto the area here. It's just short of 300 kilometers to get through there. Um, and very recently, the Guinean government has actually granted permission for the iron ore projects in this area to export uh, their uh, iron ore through Port Buchanan. They haven't granted, I don't think they've granted that to Simbu yet because I think they want to use, uh, strategically force Simbu to invest in the infrastructure to get their iron ore out uh, through one of the ports around Conakry. So what did we do? Um, we, as I said earlier, we, we understood that a new primary deposit wasn't going to be easy to find. So we looked around and when we got our spot images, uh, we also had a, a good look using good old Google. We found these open spaces. Uh, this is the Mount Nimbo range over here. Uh, Robert Friedland has just made some announcements. I think BHP owned this at the time that we were operating in the area, but I think it has now been bought out by one of Friedland's uh, companies. And this is a, a fantastic deposit sitting up, up here. Uh, we saw some of the data. I mean, there's a billion tons there of iron ore sitting at well over 62% um, in situ on the ground. So it's, it, really, it really looks good. Um, this is the old Lamco mine. This is, again, that same image, just looking at it from a slightly different angle. This is our area up here. You can see the, the sort of open spaces. This is the Ivory Coast. Now, this complicated things for us a, a hang of a lot because if we were going to do anything and we were going to get it out via Liberia, we actually had to go all the way around the mountains and then come back again. The roll, existing railway line actually links up to about here. So we, we've got a, a 50 kilometer uh, route that we need to put in, either a, a, a trucking route or a, a, a new railway line. And I, I guess that was one of the advantages of this project. It, it did not require a, you know, a billion dollars worth of infrastructure development. We simply had to link this up to the uh, rail link at, at this part over here. <coughs> Excuse me. So once we spotted this, we needed to actually come and have a look at it. We had a, a British mining engineer on, on the ground in uh, Monrovia. And Chris is a, uh, well, he's subsequently uh, studied and, and uh, at, uh, at Camborne, I think, and finished at MSc in geology. Uh, but this was, his, this was his interest. He got on a motorbike and he actually went all the way around uh, and a few implements and, and some locals and found his way into the area. <coughs> and this is what he found. I mean, these open areas were just pavements of iron ore, huge blocks. I mean, this is the size of a, of a small truck over here. Yeah? You can see where some chips have been uh, knocked off the, the thing. This is pure hematite in places. <clears throat> he took a, a bunch of grab samples and he had them analyzed and they all came back well, well, most of them in excess of 60% FE um, and the contaminants weren't bad at all. Uh, but this is a photo of Chris over here. We understood that, you know, Chris is a mining engineer. We gave him a lot of disrespect at the time. And he said, you know, you've obviously just picked up the, the best looking samples and brought them in. So the message that we took out of this was, was that there's definitely iron ore in the system. Uh, we didn't understand it because it was on low lying ground, whereas most of the other uh, hard rock uh, deposits were up uh, on mountains. Let me just have a drink of water, I'm croaking away. Um, we're up on the, on the high lying ground. Um, and so we needed to try and make sense of this. Um, Chris had identified some Portuguese drillers who were operating in the area and he got them in to, to start fast tracking and doing some, some drilling. Again, let me just step back. I'll jump to this step while I was drinking my water. He got back on the back of these results, got back to Conakry. We made some permit applications very quickly 
And in fact, through our connections or through our local partners at the time, we were able to drive those through uh, quite quickly. Um, we then, Chris uh, identified these drillers, we brought them in and he started drilling. But he, again, he didn't understand what we had. Uh, he thought that there was, this was a typical Kanga deposit where you have, the Kanga is in place, it sits on top of the etaborite, on top of the, the magnetite, and the weathering process uh, just upgrades the, the, the iron ore uh, grades. But, and so that's what he thought we had. He thought this was a deposit, underneath it would be the primary iron ore, so he started designing these angled holes to drill through. Um, and he found a very sh sort of interesting uh, uh, a set of results. It went through, you know, 10, 20 meters of this iron ore and then straight into granite. I was on the peripheral of the project at this time, um, working within the same company, but up in Zimbabwe. Um, and we suddenly realized that we were sitting on something that perhaps had some significance. So I came in, brought in a, a geological crew with me, and we had a quick look at this, and we decided immediately that this was not related to uh, any primary iron ore beneath it. Uh, it just, you could actually see from this photo, it was just a, a bunch of uh, iron ore set in a, a matrix of, of clay. Um, so the first step was to try and work out. So we stopped the drilling and said, guys, let's try and work out what it is that we had. The, the drilling gave us some information in that it penetrated through the iron ore into this underlying gravel. So we knew right away that this was not, uh, a, a, not going to lead to any uh, hard rock uh, iron ore. I'd used some GPR in Angola, looking at some uh, alluvial diamond deposits there, and I thought this technique would be well suited to giving us an idea of what lay under the ground, so we could use that information to better uh, site our drill holes and optimize and, and you know, get some value for money. So we brought in a bunch of Canadians called, from a company called Ground Radar, and they sent uh, an old chap out <laughs> this guy actually pulling his array, these are the, the GPR uh, uh, transponders over here. In his back uh, pack, he has a, 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 high, a highly accurate GPS, both of them uh, driven with timestamps. So he would walk his 10 kilometers during the day, and in the evening, uh, we would process the data, bring in the GPR and the GPS data together through the timestamp and we would generate these, uh, these cross-sectional views. And they came out really, really well. You can actually see the blue line uh, represents the, the granite uh, clay contact, uh, and the colored stuff is the, the, the kanga. We also developed some subroutines, which allowed us to actually turn this line into dynamite strength. So we had a, an accurate representation of the topography. We now had these strings that represented the uh, paleotop topography. And we merged those and we gridded the depth to bedrock. And we actually came up with what looked like three small basins um, containing this uh, Kanga material. Um, We were obviously bringing the stuff into data mine and we were using the, uh, the, the data and the information to locate our, our drill holes to make sure that we uh, sort of model this more properly. Um, and being a, an alluvial deposit, we were quite worried about the, uh, how should we call it, the grade, the lack of continuity that generally uh, is uh, typified by alluvial deposits. So we, we, we drilled a hang of a lot of holes. Initially, we, uh, we were doing a lot of coring, and then we, eventually we did a bunch of, of infill holes using RC. Um, but we were inexperienced at this stage, and we recognized that, um, you know, a couple of points. We'd stumbled onto something quite significant. We were an AIM-listed company at the time, so we obviously had to make sure that we did everything properly. So we set about trying to find an external 
independent, competent person who could assist us with this. And we looked throughout South Africa, we looked at the UK, and we couldn't find anyone that had alluvial iron ore experience. Um, my brother, uh, Patrick, I think he's on the call as well, uh, he's an ex Aglo guy, worked in the, uh, with Dr. Ina Jordan, and, and they, the company that they had established up, uh, at, down in Perth acted as the competent person for uh, Kumba uh, out in session. So I contacted him. And I just said, look, I'm on the lookout for someone who has any sort of understanding of this, uh, of this Kanga type stuff. And he actually came back and he said, look, he's got a, a, a very competent lady who worked at Simandu, um, was trained up through uh, Rio Tinto, and probably considered one of the top experts in terms of Kanga. Now, this gave me a bit of a problem because of the relationship with my brother. Uh, I couldn't go and just appoint them. So we had a few hoops that we had to jump through. I brought in our technical director who was uh, focused on coal, our financial director and our project director, Chris Perry, the mining engineer who did the motorbike trip. And we went and spent a week with Extract in Perth. And they took us through what they could do, how they could do it, um, and our guys were pretty impressed. And at the end of that week, we appointed uh, Extract as our, uh, uh, our external consultants on the, the uh, proviso that uh, the, the lady who was uh, experienced from uh, Simindu was, was appointed as our direct CP. We also uh, gathered our team of geologists and got them together. Again, a bunch of gold geologists uh, who were going to try and learn how to do alluvial iron ore. We set up our camp on site um, along strict military lines, as you can see. We senior staff on the right and the drillers on the left. Uh, we had our toilets set up, our showers, uh, a good communication set up. <laughs> so it, it worked very well. This was our, our core shed where we handled all of our core. And then our most essential piece of equipment, our uh, Huey. Um, as that earlier map showed you, I mean, getting through the conically was just not going to work for us. So we were operating out of Monrovia. And to get from Monrovia to site was a full day's drive or an hour and a half in the helicopter. Uh, we had to do the drive quite a few times because of cloud cover. And this is what we often came across. This is one of our trips going up. <clears throat> we got quite close to sites, and this guy, this truck coming down the hill had slid uh, and overturned. And then this guy had tried to sneak past the site, put his wheels in the drainage ditch, and basically the whole place was clogged up. <clears throat> we parked our land cruisers and we walked through, and our guys came down from the camp and picked us up and, and got us through. Uh, we also walked our dozer down at the time and uh, cleared up the mess uh, and got everything going. But the same accident happened about three or four days later. Uh, these guys drive like maniacs with these little 10-ton trucks, uh, just moving things between uh, uh, the Ivory Coast, uh, uh, well, Liberia and Guinea. Also, on one of my first trips, I got given the tour through Charles Taylor's old village compound. And that was quite interesting. It sort of made the hairs on the back of one's neck stand up a little bit. But uh, the history and some of the, the legacy of, of, uh, of Charles Taylor, it's, you know, the stories that you hear, they were not particularly sort of uh, nice. But back to the geology. Um, we were saying that obviously this is an alluvial iron ore deposit. The source of the iron ore is, is the top of the member range, and that's where. BHP had their, uh, their uh, big project, a, a billion tons, as I said, close to 65% uh, FE in situ. And it's a hell of a high rainfall area. So all of the stuff had been blown off the top of the mountain uh, down into the old paleo channels at the bottom over here. And this is what we'd stumbled across. Um, we brought in, as I said earlier, we did a bunch of core, 320 core holes, 
And then we did infill drilling with another 207 RC holes. We drilled out about four tons of metallurgical sample. And we did some sterilized drilling in the areas where we thought the plant would be located. Um, really just going back to our interpretation as well. Um, the material that we've got here, what we were finding was that the, the well, let me just step forward a little bit over here. The section over here shows Mount Nimba at the top here. And there's a, a, a in the wet seas, the, the water table uh, varied in that way. But the hydrostatic pressure just blew this water out. There was a, there was a spring over here and the water would just come flowing out of here, run through the, the Kanga deposit. And it actually, as I say over here, contributed to washing out the impurities that would have been contained within the orbit. Remember, the iron is falling off here. It's falling onto all of this granite material and meta sediments. It's carrying the clays down with it. And those clays are what contain the impurities within the Kanga. And what we were finding was that in the river valleys, where the Kanga was at its thickest, that is where the water flow was contained. And this water would run through it and it would remove a lot of the uh, deleterious material, the, the clays that we wanted to get rid of. Um, as I said, we had three, three areas that were identified through the GPR. This is the area where our cap was located, obviously on top of the, the best wall that we were finding. Um, and we, as you can see, we drilled, we drilled a lot of holes. Um, this is the young lady that we brought in that was the, uh, based at Simandu, uh, Mark Bidolf, our chief geologist at the time, and we had a bunch of local geos that we took on board and we spent a lot of time working with them. Uh, one of the guys from uh, Senegal, uh, Rimi was from Nigeria, and then the other guys are local. Uh, this is what the core looked like. <clears throat> so not, not pretty stuff uh, to, to take out and, and to handle. But we did. We managed to get it all uh, coded into various domains. Um, and we had a, a handheld XRF on site. So we used to sort of log all of the, the FE. And we, everything came out very consistently. If you look at this, this is, there's some borehole traces. You've got the iron ore grades coming down, so you start really good stuff, 50, 60 percent iron ore, all the way down until you start hitting the granites. And then the deleterious materials as well, your silica, your aluminium, your FEOs, your mag sus, and, uh, and all of that. And everything actually tracked uh, very, very nicely. Um, again, just some photos of some of the uh, trays and just showing the sort of material we were handling. So you can imagine in the wet season what this stuff looked like. I mean, it was just mush. Um, <clears throat> so our, our geos had, a, had, a, had a, a lot of work on their hands to actually get this all sorted out. Um, there were a lot of similarities between what we were looking at and some of the Kangal ore from the Rio Tinto operations in Western Australia. So again, in our, our uh, extract, a competent person, uh, she had seen a lot of the stuff and she was able to relate and really fill us in and make sure that we were doing uh, and handling the core and doing the work properly. This is a, a view on the, on the pavement again, and you can actually see why we had these wide open spaces. There's just nothing that can really grow, anything of substance can grow on these pavements. Going back to some of the core handling, uh, we were cutting the core on site. We were doing a lot of uh, grade control or uh, control on the samples, uh, comparing the lab, <coughs> the lab uh, grades against our handheld XRFs. Um, our handheld seemed to underread some of the, the iron ore, uh, and it wasn't particularly good on the aluminium and silica, but it gave us a good feel for what we had. Um, 
we shipped all of the samples out to Australia. Uh, we were using uh, ALS in Oz to do all of our analyses. Um, so we had a caravan that used to fly in. Uh, there was a, a little uh, airport, probably about 40 minutes drive from site. So we used to uh, bust our samples into the airport and once every week or two, this caravan would come in and pick up the samples and we would get them out. Uh, back to a, a view that I showed earlier, you can actually see what the conditions were like in the, in the rain. Sorry? We're getting terrible quality of, of, of sound here, so we might have to reschedule this thing again. Is there anything, Sorry. any electronics near you you can switch off? There seems to be an electronic intervention with your voice. No, I'm, I'm sitting in, in my office and there's nothing else here. It's, it's just we've got, as I okay. said, we're on, a, on an ADSL line in the middle of a now, of an agricultural holding. So the, the ADSL now you're fine. You're fine. is it coming back again? You're fine again now. So yeah. just carry Don't on, me. you can do it again. All right, I'll, I'm now, so hopefully that will help. Just going back to one of the slides I showed earlier to show what it looked like in the rainy season. I mean, it was just wet. And the core that we were getting out at that time as well, it was just mush. Uh, these are some of the tents that we were living in at the time. Uh, and just showing the water that, 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 that accumulated. I mentioned earlier that the, uh, we were below Mount Nimba, the BHP uh, site. This is just a view from the top of the mountain. There's a couple of air geologists. They'd seen us running around and they didn't know what we were doing. So we managed to get up on the hill with them one day and had a good chat. And this is a view of our area, the pavements at the bottom. Um, and you can actually see just stuff that wasn't grain in amongst the forests. And those are the pavements. This is their drill rig that they were using up on the side of the mountain over here. You can actually see the cables <coughs> securing the, the rig to the side. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of activity in the nature reserve. So uh, the Guinean government had cut a slot out for BHP uh, and given them approvals to actually work in the area. But it's a beautiful area uh, in terms of, of, of sites. Um, as I said, we, our initial drilling was uh, coring. We then decided to do infill drilling using an RC rig, and we wanted to make sure that uh, all of the protocols uh, that were needed to integrate the two data sets together were followed. So we brought in uh, uh, Kathleen Brody from uh, Coffee Mining to actually train our guys uh, and show them what needed to be done so that the two data sets could be integrated used uh, simultaneously. It was also uh, part of our local training programs as well. So we used her to train our local geos and try and add some value to, to the, the guys that we were using uh, <coughs> who were uh, getting it based. Um, obviously with my background and my brother's background, um, we had a we had a lot of uh, uh, computer uh, skills within our group. So we started getting all of this stuff modeled. Uh, we had uh, lovely DTMs of the area that we, that we developed. Uh, Patrick and his crew started doing variograms uh, in every uh, possible sort of uh, orientation. Uh, and we actually interrogated the data uh, particularly well. Uh, I, with my sort of, uh, well, Patrick with his Anglo experience and with the Rio Tinto background, they really insisted on doing everything properly. I wanted to do everything quickly. So we had some interesting discussions between the brothers that uh, resulted in some speed. But we got the work done and we got it done particularly well. Quickly um, and cheaply. What do you mean cheaply? You guys tried. And you tried. And arm and a leg. <laughs> You know, a lot of the guys on the call have been um, involved in alluvial programs, diamonds and gold. And one of the things that uh, 
those or these deposits are characterized by is a lack of continuity. So short ranges and high nuggets. And that's essentially what we expected in, uh, in this deposit. And we actually didn't find it. We found that there was an overprint uh, in terms of the water flow that was washing out the contaminants um, and the continuity, there was an overprint of continuity onto the data. And this continuity was aligned along the main flow directions and within the defined domains. So, you know, a little bit of a, a twist there, but it really it, it, it gave us that anomaly where you had normally in most ore bodies where you have your thick ore, it's the lower grade material. In this ore body, wherever you had thick ore, you had the best grade that occurred within within what we were looking at. So an anomaly, but a nice anomaly. Um, we went through four generations of uh, drilling and we developed a ore resource tabulation for each of those, starting at the bottom in 2012, where we tabulated 120 odd million tons at uh, just under 58% uh, FE. We upgraded that slightly uh, a couple of times and our final ore body, in fact, came out at just 200 million tons at 57.8% FE. The metallurgical work that we did showed that this stuff was uh, very interesting in that it didn't require a lot of processing. A, a simple uh, crush and screen <coughs> upgraded the iron ore uh, to plus 63%. Obviously the screening, all it did was take out the clays and the clays are what held our uh, contaminants, the, the silica and the aluminium. So by a simple crush and screen process, we could upgrade that from the 57.8 to plus 62%. Uh, so it made a lot of sense. Uh, direct selling ore is always nicer. <coughs> We've covered the geological side of things, but as, as, I, as I've alluded to, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of more work that has actually been done here. Uh, we've done uh, the metallurgical studies, the drop tests, the decrepitization uh, index, et cetera, et cetera, with all of the material that we shipped through to the CSIRO in Australia. We've done port and rail studies. We had a, an Aussie that spent two weeks following the, the railway line <coughs> from Port, port Buchanan all the way up to, to site. Uh, we've been granted uh, rail access from, uh, from uh, through Liberia to Port Buchanan. The PFS study has been completed by Extract and we were in the process of doing the bankable, so-called bankable feasibility when we had to shelve the project. Uh, when we ran, we bumped straight into Ebola, uh, which came out of the forests, pretty close to where we, are, we were working. And also the iron ore price dropped from about $140 a ton down to 40. Uh, we needed a, a robust price, probably northwards of $70 a ton to make this uh, work properly. Um, we've maintained the license. It's been sort of packaged and put on hold. Uh, there's been a couple of attempts at dusting it off uh, and having a look at it, but nothing has developed or come through yet. So the guys are, are still waiting. Uh, again, that's it in a, in a nutshell. I mean, here is the, a picture of the, the railway line. Um, so there's an existing line from Port Buchanan all the way up to Tokadu, which is where the Austin Metal is. There's a, 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 an existing line that goes through to your Yekepa, but it's not used and it would need to be refurbished. And then <clears throat> the red line is where we'd have to put in uh, a whole road or another uh, uh, railway to get things out. Um, and that's about it, guys. I mean, there's, I've prepared a bunch of other slides which I, just really show CSIRO and the test work that's been done. It, it's beyond this side of geology. So a lot of the uh, metallurgy has been done. And, and all of the indices come through very well. The reduction in the situation is good. The lump chemistry is good. The decrystallization. I think uh, someone's going to ask me what that is. That's really the explosibility of the, the, the sub uh, micro particles when they go through a lost furnace, whether they explode or not. Uh, and our stuff was pretty good. Uh, 
Uh, we've ranked it according to uh, most of the other iron ore. It ranks pretty well. Uh, again, some of our reserve work that's been done. So this has been run through a pit optimization, the Lech Grossman process as well. We've looked at infrastructure. We've got a, a layout done in terms of the mine uh, and where the conveyors are going to be. We've looked at railway lines, we've looked at uh, wall roads, we've looked at a port layout. So this has been taken pretty far. Uh, and that's about it, guys. Thanks, Richard. Good stuff. So, so please would people open their mics and you can put on your videos and we can now grill you. And it sounds like we need Pat's um, comments first off. And yeah. just, a quick, just a quick one from a mining side, Richard. Is it all sort of easy, free digging stuff? Um, no, it's, it's not going to be free digging. I mean, there's these huge okay. big lumps of iron ore. They're going to have to be uh, drill and blast. Okay. Yeah, but right. but your blo your blastability index is is pretty low. You don't need big. Um, you just need to bump it and, and crack it really. Um, okay. Not Fantastic. not 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 huge, um, competent material that you have to break. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Murat. But uh, people got their videos on. Unmute your videos so we can see who's talking. If I could make a comment, John. Um, yeah, please, Adrian. Uh, Richard, that was very interesting. I mean, I've always thought iron ore was the sort of lowest form of geology. You know, you just go and drill a few holes and there's nothing to it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was interesting to see the sophistication you had in there. Um, you talked about rainfall. You know, we were a, a few hundred kilometers to the south of you in Liberia, and we were talking three and a half thousand Three and a half thousand millimeters, three and a half meters a year. Was that similar yeah. to what you were getting? Exactly the same, Adrian. Three, three to four meters a year uh, that we that we were experiencing. It was it was particularly wet. Yeah. And that all came down in four months. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so when you get to dig a pit in there, you're going to have to have booms and diversions and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Patrick had he sent in a, a hydro specialist, in fact, looking at it because it, you know there was just such a, a, a difference between the wet season and the dry season that it was you know it was like chocolate and cheese. Yeah. yeah. Adrian, on on the northern side of of the uh, ore body, um, the start of the pit would have been a huge drainage drain that drained the water before it went into the pit. Um, into the, 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 the natural drainage on the side. So we would have mined ore, but left the drain up northwards, up uphill, so to speak, so that yeah. it was mostly self-draining. Yeah, got you. Mm. Um, mm. And I guess one of the big advantages of having, apart from the fact you've got a deposit, you've got iron ore covering what presumably was fertile ground, um, but it's not fertile with iron ore on it, so you don't have hundreds of people with little farms that you've got to deal with. It looked pretty uninhabited around there. It, well, we, we, we actually thought it was uh, uninhabited. There's a lot of little villages around, um, and it's, it's really a pristine area, and uh, we fell into the trap of drinking. We, we drilled some boreholes for water, and we thought this is a, a pristine area. We were all drinking the water until everyone started coming down with uh, <laughs> stomach stomach problems. And we did some tests that we found that uh, uh, the people used to do ablutions in the river just up the road from where we were where we were drilling. E. coli was running at about two thousand parts per million in the water. Mm. Sure, familiar. Scary. Um, yes. mm. Mm. And, and and just Richard, just I mean, then then on the actual mode of deposition, I mean, so so age-wise, this is sort of still happening, relatively speaking, with that ongoing weathering and transport down the, the slope. Yeah, it is. It's it's fairly recent stuff. Um, mm. You know, we we didn't do a lot of analysis in terms of looking at the, the age, and uh, you know, we were yeah, trying yeah. to be quite practical in terms of what we were doing. So there wasn't a, a lot of academic work that was, that was done in it. We were just saying, look, there's the stuff. If we try to understand uh, the, 
the mode and also the overprint of this of this the meteoric water just flowing through it. Uh, there were also very big cavities in the the deposit as well uh, that we had to actually look at, and mm. it was I mean these things filled up with mud and then they'd get washed out again and then they'd start filling up with mud again. It was, it was it's, 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 it's really it's it's an environment that as as you point out is developing in in in, in current time uh, time scales. And especially the, the upgrading yeah, yeah. process is, is continuing. If you go back to the, the section that shows the different grades, um, you'll, you'll see how the iron ore grade drops off at about 30 meters. But all your silicas and, and aluminas pick up. So that, that's mm. kind of the, the, the sort of mm. drainage surface at the moment. And, and, and that was actually brilliant that we picked that up because that is also the boundary between material which you can DSO, in other words, just crush and screen uh, and sell it as a direct selling ore, other than the, the lower down ore, you would still need your scrubbers and that to get rid of that sticky clay. And, you know, that sticky clay, it's worse than bloody kimberlite. It sticks to shit, to, to anything. You can't it, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't even run on a belt. It just sticks, you know. Personally, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in a broad sense, it has sort of some similarities with um, the manganese deposits up in in the, in the northwest of, here, of South Africa. Here, you know, the, the manganese that sort of reworked and settled into the Macondos. Yeah. Just and obviously you've got you've got granite basement. They they had those dolomites um, that the manganese filled in. Okay, more more questions. And and, and interesting, Richard. I mean, all all of that work. Um, obviously, I, I guess Syro and the Australian institutions. I mean, does that expertise developed over their years and years of these massive iron ore deposits that get mined in Australia? Yep. Patrick can catch that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of um, iron ore expertise in Australia because you know the western side of Australia is just basically one big lump of iron ore in the Pilbara, um, as well as 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 um, Simandu and other uh, international assets as well. Um, but yeah, we also Richard also didn't mention we had a a crazy metallurgist on our team as well, who was a bit of an iron ore buff. He actually used to work at the CSIRO of all places. And um, in his holidays, he used to go and visit steel mills, mm. you know, back in India and in China, you know, and, yeah. and that to him was, was, was a holiday well spent. Um, so I, I, I don't think I'll say any more, but, you know, a bit of a, bit of a fanatical iron ore fella and, and it was actually him that, that sort of identified the subtle difference between the clay and the sticky clays, as he called it. And he, he did a species analysis and, and goodness knows what all uh, to clearly identify it so that we could model it. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of, as Richard said, they had, they had scanned around looking for iron ore expertise and... Uh, yeah, he found it in Australia. There's, there's, there's heaps of it here. Okay. Can I ask, can I ask over, over what area would this alluvial iron or, iron or be deposited? Uh, is it a very large area? And secondly, would it be washed down the rivers as well? The, the area is, is, is actually adjacent to, uh, literally it's within a kilometre, a kilometre and a half of the of the primary uh, ore body, which is at the top of the hill, and it's it's not widely distributed. Okay? It, it really comes off. You can actually see uh, uh, in the picture uh, the, the rivers that are coming off the mountain, and it really just came off the mountain and it came off at a, at a hang of a pace, and then just settled in the in the valleys at the bottom of the mountain. We didn't see any evidence of any wider distribution. It's just too heavy to. to on, on the northern side of, of Mount Nimba, we, we drilled a few holes into what was known as Plateau One. 
uh, they were a lot shallower, a lot lower grade. Um, and yeah, they were a bit further away from the, the, the rainfall, the rework, the source of the energy of reworking and the water. Um, but if you go back to that, one of those early slides um, where you had the, uh, the ISO view of, of Mount Nimba, you can see the, the very shallow um, plateaus around the mountain and, and, but nothing further away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, yeah, that one. Yeah. In the yeah, future, could you mine into the mountain as well? Would there be deposits inside the mountain? Oh, that's the hematite. Mountain, the Mount Nimba deposit that was owned by BHP and is now owned by Freeland is on is the, is the really the centre of this mountain range. So sitting up here, they've got a billion ton sitting at sixty five percent FE. It's mm. a detaborite uh, that is the core of the mountain. It was mined down uh, here by land. AMCO in the 1950s and 60s. So, but we couldn't. I mean, this is our area over here. And this, uh, this tree area over here is a strict nature reserve. Uh, there's also no iron ore. There's no, uh, none of this uh, Kanga material that has actually developed. And that's why the, the forest is actually developed. So wherever we've got Kanga, we've got bare ground, effectively. Uh, and it's all come from the top of the mountain here. And, and, and Richard, I mean, just, just moving a step further, so iron ore today, I think, is around $100 or $105 uh, a ton. So, you know, you, you're back in the money, so to speak. But I, but I guess, and, and then uh, I'm, I'm now sort of um, getting into the bigger picture here and looking, you know, late, later next month, we'll have a discussion on, you know, why certain countries um, develop their mineral deposits, you know, largely for the benefit of their populations. Other have this amazing wealth, but never, never really works out. But I guess a lot of a, a, a commodity like this really hinges on on infrastructure and you know government's ability to build infrastructure to move you know vast quantities of ore to ports that um, it can then ship it. And I mean, presumably West Africa is closer to China than than Brazil. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I think what's going to happen here, John, is that there's been a, a couple of press releases over the last couple of days from Friedland that he's secured yes. World Bank funding for the proper amount that the, the, the you know the primary ore body up here, and it just makes absolute sense for him to acquire this. And yeah. while they while they're developing the, the top of the mountain, this is easy easily mineable. They could develop, the, I mean, the infrastructure that is needed. They've already uh, negotiated or they're in the process of negotiating with Oslo Mattel to get access to the rail uh, from uh, uh, the bottom part. From <coughs> to, uh, so you're going to go through Liberia? It'll have to go through Liberia. You can't, the, there's no infrastructure in place to get it through to, to Conakry at the moment. And they have, they have yeah. a, a permission from the Guinean government and the Liberian government to ship this all out to Port Buchanan. Okay, good stuff. Yeah, I guess, so Robert hasn't called you yet? No, <laughs> not yet. You say you sent yeah. him your presentation. Sorry, I lost that one. I said, you've sent him your presentation. Not yet, not yet. Now, look, I mean, the, they are, the, the local uh, shareholder in the project is based in Conakry, and he's a, a big wheeler and dealer, a really good guy, but I'm sure they'll be talking. Yeah. Yeah. The, okay. The, 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 the thing that's held that entire area up is, is access to export via Liberia. Yeah. Um, Number was it's the first first um, explorers to get that um, permission, and it looks like it's going further now. But still not for Simandu, um, although we we sort of because they want Simandu to build a rail a, a cross country rail to to Conakry, which Conakry. will help their John which will help their, their country um, infrastructure. I actually mentioned to. I at one stage mentioned to the president's uh, advisor. Okay. No, all right. We're all right. Carry on. Sorry, Pat. 
Yeah, no worries. I, I and you, actually, you get most of it. I suggested to the president to or me, Kimi's advisor I saw the, that the eventually I couldn't figure out. Sorry, Pat, go ahead. Yeah, anyway, well, I'll just try to point out to the guys that if they gave Simon do a 10 year license um, with export duties to, to get going via Liberia and Buchanan, that the duties and export duties that would be liable over the, over the 10 years would pay them to build their own, would be enough money to build their own rail. Okay. Uh, but they didn't kind of bite on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. So thanks everyone for, um, for your participation. Thanks Richard, thanks Pat, that was a, a really good discussion. Thanks Adrian for raising points. Uh, has anyone else got a, um, a last couple of points to raise for the speakers while they're still on? Yeah, considering it's already beer time down here. <laughs> uh, time for another cup of coffee. <laughs> Where are thanks, you mate. thanks, Pat. Uh, in Sydney, Australia. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. And, and, no, and, no worries. And, and what was giving your 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 um, throat problem, Richard? Were you on the strong whiskey early this morning? No, I think I I, I have allergies. I think, and I'm allergic to I mean grass pollen. And this time of the year, it's it's, it's horrible out here. Okay, in the high felt. Yeah. Right, so. All right, so we look forward to your next presentation on another exotic place called Mongolia, which has also obviously been your stomping ground and got some amazing geology. And I guess Robert was also there. He is. Indeed, yeah. he is. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Henny. Are you still there, Henny? We lost you. Uh, John, do you think uh, we could repeat this uh, recording if, yeah. uh, if he's willing to do that? Um, absolutely. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Good idea. Yeah. If you could send us your PowerPoint presentation and we project it from our side and you just respond to the slides, then we don't have a bandwidth problem, if that's at all possible. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send it across as soon as we finish.